Well, I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and go with me to the book of Mark, the first chapter. I'd like to invite those that are able to stand, to stand with me as I read Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 16, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately they, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we approach thy throne, and we've opened our hearts and we've opened your word. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be accepted in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our soon to return Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, how many of you know what the Super Bowl is all about? Come on, fess up. Even if you're not a football fan, you've heard of the Super Bowl. You want proof? What day of the week is Super Bowl played on? Sunday, I, I think probably everyone in here knew that. You know, I guess you understand that most, if not all sports teams, love it when their fans get involved, when the fans get energetic, when they get excited. You see, when the fans get excited, what happens to the team? They get pumped up. They get more into playing the game. Well, I guess you also know that we preachers like it when members respond to our messages. You know, I've been thinking about doing something. Asking one of my deacons to stand over here with a sign that says amen when you've missed a great opportunity to say amen. He's going to hold it up. And for those that are too shy to voice amen... I'm going to ask my deacons to hand you a sign when you walk in. And when you agree with what the speaker says, you can hold it up. Preach it, preacher! <laughs> Friends, I hope you understand I say all that in jest. But at the same time, we do know all around the world there are people who love it when their supporters get excited when they've scored the points, or if it's someone that knows how to sing, when they sing a beautiful song and they get a you know, nice applaud. In fact, stadiums throughout this country are designed that people are sitting all the way around the sports team. They do that, folks, so that if somebody over here gets excited, it just dominoes all the way around. Well... We're still in our series called Footsteps of Jesus. Our first sermon, which by the way, you'll find these DVDs out in the foyer. Uh, and, and praise the Lord, Renee now every week sets them up, or puts them up on our website. But uh, the first sermon was the Church of Jesus. Our second sermon is, was, do we meet the criteria to be called a Christian? Then the last time we had one of our series, it was entitled, When the Devil Comes Knocking. And today we're going to look at, are you a fan or are you a follower? You know, in the sports world, there are fans and there are followers. Well, what about in the Christian world? You know, something interesting I discovered while I was studying for this sermon is that Jesus never, ever once went looking for fans or admirers. 
Yes, now he had people that we might consider or call a fan or an admirer. But Jesus didn't go seeking them out. In fact, I believe if you'll study the life of Jesus out fully, you'll discover that he did just the opposite. I believe Jesus went through the crowds weeding out the fans. I believe he went seeking for followers. Going back to our scripture there in Mark chapter 1. Right after Jesus was in the desert, which was our last sermon, the 40 days, he comes back and he begins his, the second part of his ministry by calling his disciples. And in Mark chapter 2, we find that Jesus goes to, of all places, he goes to a tax collector's office, the IRS, and finds one of his first followers, his first disciple. And he tells Matthew, come follow me. And Matthew put everything to the, to the side. He left it all to follow Jesus. Folks, that tells me that Jesus is not looking for fans. No, Jesus is out seeking followers. Something I want you to think about for a moment. This phrase that Jesus said, follow me. I guess you realize that was a command as well as an invitation. And it wasn't just given to his disciples of that day. I believe, and I'll show you more why I believe this, he is speaking to us today to come follow him. So here's my next question I have for you. Have you obeyed that command? Have you left everything and accepted, answered his invitation? In other words, are you a follower of Jesus this morning or are you a fan? Now, write this verse down in your bulletin insert. I added it this morning, so it's not on your list of Bible verses. But Matthew twenty two fourteen says, For many are called... But few are chosen. Now, odds are there's someone here this morning that's thinking, Now, Pastor, I'm not sure I understand the difference between a follower or a fan. But folks, I'm about to show you there is a huge difference between a follower of Jesus and a fan of Jesus. And I want to do so by sharing with you three differences. So you're going to need your bulletin insert, and you're going to need a pen. If you don't have a pen, there should be one in front of you because you're going to fill in the blanks. Now, trust me, folks, of all my inserts, this is the one you want to take the time to fill in. Difference number one, the difference between a fan and a follower. Fans know about Jesus. But a follower knows Jesus. Friends, I hope that that will help you understand the huge difference between a follower and a fan. Fans know about him, but a true follower knows him. John 17, 3, Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus says, Father, I'm praying that my people will know you. Now notice, he did not say they will know about you. They will know you. Jesus wants his people to have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with him and the Father. But as I travel around, I find many people 
are nothing more than followers when it comes to being a Christian. What does the word Christian mean? Christ-like. You see, I find people all the time that know about Jesus, they, they love to quote some scriptures. They'll know a few in their defense. But they're not really true followers. They do not have a personal relationship with Jesus as their personal Savior. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Now, I'm going to show you some faces on the screen. And if you know who that person is, raise your hand, say amen, yes, whatever, okay? But stay with me because I have a point to make. Does anyone know who that person is? Who is it? Brad Pitt, okay. All right, how about this person? Let me give you a hint. She loves to wave. Queen Elizabeth, okay. All right, any Beatles fans here? Who's that? Paul McCartney, yes. Now, most of you just admitted that you've heard of these people. You may know a little bit about them. But how many of those people do you personally know? I mean, you know, folks, you can go to Brad Pitt's fan club page. You can find out what his favorite food is. You can find out when his birthday is. You can find out how many children he has. You can find out how many times he's been married and who's next in line. But honestly, how many here have ever met him, shook his hand, sat down, and had a cup of hot tea with him? No. In other words, you know about Brad Pitt, but you do not know Brad Pitt. So you see, fans, there is a difference. There are those fans that know about Jesus, but a follower knows him. And that brings me to difference number two between a follower and a fan. Fans want the blessings, but followers want the blesser. In other words, a fan is only interesting, interested in the blessings that Jesus offers. They are only interested in what they can get out of the deal. I want to show you what I believe is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible of the difference between a fan and a follower. Take your Bible and go to John chapter 6. If you want to follow along in your version, I'll have the words on the screen. Now, I'm going to ask a favor of you, and you'll hear me say this a couple of times. Your homework assignment today is read the entire chapter of John chapter 6. And as you'll see, there's a lot of verses. So I'm going to go through it, but I'm just going to give you a, a summary. I'm going to pray that you will take the time when you get home and read the entire chapter so you'll understand what is all happening here? At the beginning of John chapter 6, we find Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. Most scholars believe that somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people. And then in verse 5, Jesus says, Where shall we buy bread that we may go, that they may eat? Now, 15 to 20,000 people, it's going to be a lot of food, right? I like what Philip says in verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 denarii. By the way, that's 200 days wages. Whatever you make a day, multiply that by 200. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. In other words, Philip is saying, Lord, <laughs> Send them home. Let them go to, to Taco Bell themselves, buy their own food. We don't have enough money to buy all the food we would need to feed this bunch. But listen to verses 8 through 10 now. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. You know, I've often wondered why he'd even bring this up. I mean, come on, five loaves of bread and two small fish? 
Why would he even bring this up? But he does. And so Jesus says, have them sit down. Well, you know the story, folks. They feed all 15 to 20,000 people there. And then they pick up the leftovers. How many baskets full of leftovers were there? Twelve. One for each disciple, by the way. You know, I can't help but believe this probably blew the mind off of all of the fans there. They probably went wild. Wild. Five loaves of bread and two fish and he fed all this? What else can he do for us? Why do I say that? Because look what happens next. Jump down to verse 24. When the people... Now there again, folks, you're going to need to read between those verses to understand all that took place. But listen to this. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now friends, listen to what I'm about to say next, because this is important. Fans seek the Lord. They seek the Lord out for what he will give them. Fans want his blessings. They want his goodies, and that's about all. But what does a follower want? Well, first, a follower does not seek out, seek out God's handouts. No, a follower seeks God's face. Do you remember the story of Job? There in Job chapter 1. Remember they're in heaven. God is, and there's a meeting going on. Satan says something to God about Job. Listen. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The devil says, Lord, the only reason Job follows you is because of the blessings you've given him. But if you allow me to take away your blessings, he'll curse you to your face. Well, you know the, the story, what happens next. In one day, Job loses everything. He loses his wealth, his servants, and all of his children. And finally, Job says in verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And between there and when you get to Job 13, verse 5, 15, a lot takes place. Read it. Finally, Job says this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, all along, who does Job think is causing all this? He thinks God is all along. But folks, the whole book of Job shows that Job did not serve God for stuff. He served God because he was God. He served God because he loved him. He wasn't a, a, a fan. Job was a follower. He accepted whatever God gave or took away. Although we know the other side of the coin, it wasn't God. But Job didn't know that. How many times have you and I blamed God when possibly it wasn't God that did it? 
was the devil. Amen. I wonder if the devil has ever stood in front of God and said, your name, my name. Yeah, they're only serving you because you bless them so. Give me five minutes and they'll curse you to your face. I wonder. Maybe someday we'll know. But Job was a follower. He wasn't a fan. Job sought God's face. He did not seek God's handouts. Never forget what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Yes, folks, a fan wants his blessing, but a follower wants the blesser. Amen. Which brings us to difference number three, the difference between a fan and a follower. Fans bail out, but followers are all in. Going back to John chapter 6, Jesus responds to the people, and he does so by separating the fans from the followers. Again, please take the time to read all of John chapter 6. But in verse 26, Jesus told the huge crowd of people that followed him, You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And then in verse 48, Jesus says, But I am the bread of life. And then I'll drop down to 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Now listen to verse 66. And by the way, it's an easy way to remember this verse. It's John 6, 6-6. Six, six. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. You said, Jesus, man, you fed us yesterday with real bread. It was good. We had that fish. You gave us all the things we needed. You provided our needs. But now you're saying you are the bread of life? Sorry, that won't feed my family. Forget it. We're out of here. And they bailed out on Jesus. Mark this down, fam, folks. Mark this down. Fans are fair weathered. What do I mean? Let's go back to a football game. Any kind of sports game. When everything's going great, the umpire's making great calls. Everybody, yay! But you let that player drop that ball. You let that umpire make the wrong call and you watch what the sports fans do. Amen. They'll turn on that team in a heartbeat. You know, Cowboys ain't done very good in the last few years, and I'm meeting a lot of people saying, I used to be a Cowboy fan. Well, I, I'm still a fan. You know, there are those that are fair-weathered. And the fans in John chapter 6, when Jesus said that I'm the bread of life, they turned on him in a heartbeat. And they walked away. Why? Because he wasn't doing what they thought he should be doing and what they wanted. They wanted to sit home and have Jesus supply all of their needs kick their shoes off get in their easy chair why should I work I've got you I'll we'll give you another example go to Mark chapter 11 the first 11 verses is about the the triumph entry the triumphal entry Jesus is on a donkey this is the Sunday before the crucifixion in verse 9, we find the people cheering. In fact, the Bible says they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were so glad they wanted to crown him king right then. 
But just a few days later, the exact same people in Pilate's hall were saying, crucify. Friends, Jesus isn't looking for fans. Jesus is seeking followers, those who are fully committed to him no matter what. I recently heard this illustration between being involved and committed. Some of you may have heard this illustration before, but stay with me. I want to make a point. Do you know the difference between bacon and eggs? Well, the answer is the chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. Wait a minute. We're Adventist. That's supposed to flip there. We're Adventist. We don't eat the pig. Oh, I got an idea. We'll make them turkeys. Turkey bacon. And for those of us that are vegetarians, vegetarian turkey bacon. So what is the difference between bacon and turkey bacon? Uh, eggs and turkey bacon. Well, folks, the chicken's involved by giving the egg. But the poor turkey, he had to give his life for the bacon. So one is committed and one is just involved. And it's the same thing with what I'm trying to say here. You have the fans and you have the followers. One's committed and one's just involved. Going back to John chapter 6, verse 67. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Back in 66, you had the follow the fans bailed out. But then you have the 12 followers, and they say, Lord, we're all in. We are committed to you. We will die for you. And you know the story of many of the disciples. They did. Now, I want you to notice something about followers. And this is in your bulletin insert. But true followers surrender their hearts to Jesus. Followers give their hearts to the Lord fully. That's what makes them a follower. A follower entrusts their life to Jesus. A follower is all in no matter what happens. Second, a true follower has abandoned their former way of life. Do you remember our scripture there in Mark chapter 1? Jesus called Peter and his brother Andrew and says, Come follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. In the very next verse, verse 18, Mark says they immediately left their nets and followed him. They dropped everything. Then the next two verses... Jesus calls James and John. Listen. He, talking about Jesus, saw James and John, his brother, who were, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. James and John. Do you know what the other name of them was? Sons of Thunder. Yet they immediately left their father. And followed Jesus. They left their business, their way of life, their their livelihood to follow Jesus fully. And don't forget what we read there in, about Matthew in Mark two fourteen. Matthew had a good paying job with the IRS, and he gives it up. And walks away from everything to follow Jesus. Folks, each one of these men left their old way of life for one thing and one thing only. To follow Jesus. Not for what he would give them. 
Now, yes, they argued amongst themselves, as we discussed in previous sermons, who was the greatest and all. But bottom line is, they gave it up. They gave up everything for Jesus. So what am I saying to us today? If we're going to follow Jesus fully, then we have to abandon our old way of life. What does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians 5.17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Your cursing stops. Your smoking stops. Your drinking stops. Beating your spouse stops. Running around, your spouse stops. I mean, folks, you understand what I'm saying. Your old way of life stops. You walk away from it. True followers leave everything behind. And third, true followers are fishers of men, like our children's story. When Jesus told Peter and Andrew, follow me and I'll make you the fishers of men, folks, I want you to know he wasn't just talking to those two men. He was talking to you and me today. How do I know that? Go to Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of age. And lastly, number four, true followers will stay true to Jesus all the way to glory. In John chapter 10, starting with verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. How do you know if you're one of his sheep? How do you know if you're a follower or a fan this morning? First John chapter 2 says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. How many commandments are in the Ten Commandments? So how many are we to keep? And if you say you're a commandment keeper, if you say you're a Christian, you say you follow Jesus and you break one, Jesus says you broke them all. Folks, if you're not living up to what the Word says, then the answer to the question is, on whether you're a fan or a follower, well, you decide. As I begin to bring this to a close, just remember, a true follower of Jesus will hold solid to his word even when it's not popular. And come on, folks, we're often criticized and laughed at because we believe in the entire Bible. We do believe God blessed and kept the seventh-day Sabbath and told us to. So are we true to our word by saying we're Christians? Or do we hide things? Also remember that today, folks, if you get nothing else out of this sermon, remember this. Jesus is not looking for fans. If you're a fan, well, you don't need to return next week. But if you're a follower, Jesus is seeking you. So which one are you this morning? There's a place on your bulletin insert to write in your answer. Are you a follower? Or if you're a fan? I hope you'll take time to write that in now or later. Now when we return in two weeks, next week Kathy and I will be in Minden. We're going to look at the topic, 
sinners welcome. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 13. So I hope you'll take time today to read John chapter 6. And between now and two weeks, read Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 13. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that every one of us in this room, if we were not followers when we entered, we're followers now. When we leave these doors, we'll stay true to your word, no matter what comes our way. Because, Lord, we don't seek you for the blessings. We seek you, your face, because you are God. Because we love you. And we will serve you all the way to glory. I pray that each and every one of us will always, always be there for you, as you have always been there for us. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing song is page 343.